Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to virtual conference of Thailand Halal Assembly 2020. In this afternoon, we will start on the topic scientific and innovation approach in the new normal era. We have an honorable speakers with us in this session. First one, Professor Dr. Mozart Abdel Wahab. Food Toxicology and Contaminants Department, National Research Center, Doki, Cairo, Egypt. Next one, Dr. Said Gulam Musharraf, Professor in Bioanalytical Chemistry, Research Institute of, Chem of Chemistry, ICCBS, University of Karachi, Pakistan. And Associate Professor Dr. Minhas Udin Ahmed, Principal Investigator at Biosensors and Nanobiotechnology Laboratory, Bandar Seri Begawan, University Brunei Darussalam. And Ms. Kesini Ketleha, PhD candidate, Research Assistant of the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. And moderator of this session, Dr. Ashari Suksuan. May I introduce moderator for this session, Dr. Ashari Suksuan, researcher of the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, and area of expertise, molecularly imprinted polymers, nanomaterials, molecular imprinting, and nanoparticle synthesis. Please welcome Dr. Ashari Suksuan. Welcome back to Thailand Halal SMB International Seminar in the third session that related to scope of a scientific and innovation approach in the new normal era. This topic is very really important for us because we are facing with the COVID-19 pandemic that changed our lifestyle. Especially the people are more concerned about their health and safety. So the Halal food is one of the many challenges that can help us to protect us uh, to uh, form the global health crisis. So in this session, we have uh, for distinguished speaker from Egypt, Pakistan, Brunei, and Thailand to find a way of strategy to monitor the quality of food in Halal and Tayyip aspect for improving quality of our life in the new normal era. Because we are a little bit late. So let's start with the first speaker. May I invite Professor Dr. Sayyid Kura Musharraf from SEJ Research Institute of Chemistry, International Center for Chem Chemical and Biological Science, uh, University of Karachi, uh, Pakistan. His expert is on biological and organic mass spectrometry, and today he will talk about uh, special emphasis on the analysis of food substance forbidden by the Islam. Uh, Professor Mashallah. Yes, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, brother. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum and good afternoon uh, uh, to the participants, especially uh, from Thailand, because in Pakistan we are still have a good morning. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm going to talk about actually, uh, a special, a special emphasis on the analysis of uh, food substances forbidden by the Islam. Uh, you know, my research laboratory uh, is working on the application of mass spectrometry uh, in various fields, uh, including uh, disease progression, understanding the biomarker, uh, metabolomics, proteomics. At the same time, we are working since last few years on foodomics, uh, where we are trying to analyze the different compounds associated for 
associated with food quality and food, uh, you know, the quality uh, uh, issue purpose. So uh, very briefly, especially, I would like to highlight that what mass spectrometry is, is actually for the those who are not familiar with this technique. So uh, mass spectrometry a kind, is a kind of uh, a technique by which you can uh, and, uh, determine the molecular weight of the compounds uh, and obviously molecular formula as well. So this technique uh, is, uh, is indeed a very state of the art technique available uh, uh, by the different companies because the mass spectrometers currently is coupled with a wide variety of uh, chromatographic tools including uh, LC, uh, including TLC, including GC. So the GC MS MS you may have, you have uh, an LC MS MS instrument not only for the separation of compounds but for the analysis of compounds as well. Um, the most important part of the uh, technique which I would like to highlight is about the uh, sensitivity of uh, the instrument because uh, uh, the mass spectrometers are quite sensitive to detect the very low concentration of the compounds. Like in this slide, you can see that one of the authors have reported the detection of uh, uh, compounds up to 800 yucto moles level, which is just uh, beyond imagination, in fact. But as for the routine analysis concerned, the picogram or femtograms are the quite routine analysis concentration that we use to monitor in foods, uh, analysis of pesticide and all these, you know, the compounds. So, so the mass spectrometers is indeed a, a good option and a very reliable uh, technique, especially to add address the different issues related to food quality. So uh, uh, as I have mentioned that my uh, laboratory is working on the metabolomic side. So uh, metabolomics is the, the phenotypic uh, appearance of the gene expression is the end products, ultimate end products, the functional compound that plays a very important role uh, in the body. So metabolomics uh, are comparatively easy to address, comparatively easy to analyze uh, uh, in comparison with the proteins or transcriptomes and genome. Uh, the techniques which usually use for the metabolomics monitoring are so many, but uh, as I have mentioned that the mass instruments are the techniques of choice by which you can analyze very effectively. Uh, and similarly, the NMR instruments are also there. So we have worked on the NMR as well. So we have actually focused on mainly uh, on the metabolomics part uh, of, uh, of food uh, by which we can identify the different uh, issues and answer the different questions of the, uh, you know, the associated with food. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, the one, uh, one of the important issues associated with the meat, especially with the chicken meat, uh, because this is our, one of our preliminary studies. Uh, you know, the, it's quite easy to identify the uh, type of meat, I mean, with the help of genomics analysis, uh, whether the meat is from, uh, you know, the chicken or from the from some other uh, forbidden source, like from pork or whatever the source, with the help of genomics. But the question associated is whether the meat is uh, zabiha or not. So that is something, uh, you know, uh, important questions that we have addressed uh, in last few years. Uh, so what we have tried in this study, we have uh, uh, we have analyzed the meat obtained from the Zabiha slaughtering and non-Zabiha slaughtering. In addition to that, we have also analyzed the meat uh, that we have collected from the dead uh, chicken sample because you know that during the transportation of the uh, chicken, they, they sometimes they might be dead on arrival. So that, that was the sample that we have collected. So uh, a very strong statistical controlled uh, uh, meats were obtained uh, uh, from, from a butcher shop. 
uh, and in, in Zabiha, we, we followed the normal Zabiha process, procedure without cutting the spinal cord. In non-Zabiha, we followed uh, cutting of spinal cord, not the stent, but simply the uh, uh, cutting of spinal cord. So these type of samples that we have processed and uh, uh, subjected to the mass spectrometric analysis. And, you know, we, uh, as you can see that this paper is recently published in Arabian Journal of Chemistry uh, this year. So details can be seen, especially the preparation of uh, sample that how we process the sample and how we prepare the sample and how we extract the sample was very simple. Uh, uh, it just, we just extracted in the mixture of methanol and uh, chloroform and then followed by the LC MSMS analysis. Uh, very obvious uh, that we have optimized the chromatographic procedure because uh, it's not that easy to handle a complex sample like meat. So after necessary optimization of chromatographic parameter, which I'm not discussing here, which you can see in the in the in the published paper. So you can see that this is the uh, uh, LCSI MS uh, chromatogram of three different groups and uh, Zabiha, DAD, and non Zabiha. And you can see that apparently they are quite similar, except the difference uh, uh, of their intensities of some peaks. So this what we were expecting, this what we were actually looking for, because we were uh, uh, trying to identify the differential metabolites in terms of obviously their concentration. So that was our objective. And fortunately, we by just looking this uh, uh, chromatogram, we were happy that we have seen some compounds with different intensities. So these peaks were subjected into rigorous analysis uh, of uh, uh, of a statistical tool because uh, uh, in order to see whether the compounds uh, which observed in all three groups are differentiable or not. So we have applied a different uh, 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 statistical tool, including uh, OPLSDA model analysis, volcano plot, and all these pictures. You can see that the, the pictures, the, especially the groups uh, in the, on the right side, you can see that all three groups based on their features were quite differentiated and that is encouraging because we were uh, we were expecting that these metabolites the identity the, the differential metabolites that we have identified should be able to differentiate the meat obtained from different uh, you know the slotting process so uh, the statistical tool somehow showed a, a sign of good sign of differentiation uh, for which we, for, we have further uh, investigated, uh, you know, the identification of compounds. So, uh, you know, we have tried our best to identify the as much as possible compounds uh, with the help of different databases. As you know that uh, the uh, the database, especially related to ESI tender mass spectrometry, is not very well uh, updated yet. Uh, uh, you can use some kind of NIST MS library or mass of Europe, uh, you know, uh, uh, American library. So there are some databases by which you can blast your finding and then try to identify those compounds. So uh, fortunately, we were able to identify the five compounds that were observed with the differentiable intensities. And you can see that the pub IDs and the retention times in the table, the observed mass and the formula, the ion type, and the PPM error was quite low and the, the fragmentation pattern was also observed quite close with the published one. So these five compounds that we have identified as a differential compounds between, especially between the Zabiha and non-Zabiha meat, uh, in addition to that, uh, you can see a list of 25 compounds that somehow currently we were not able to def identify exactly uh, 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 these compounds, like what are these compounds, but uh, you can see the p-values were quite low and really good, especially to differentiate between the non-Zabiha and Zabiha. So in future, maybe that, uh, you know, in continuation of this study, we, we will be able to uh, somehow identify all these compounds and then we can use all these uh, compounds as a panel biomarker for the differentiation of these two slotting process meet. 
Uh, as I have mentioned that in most of the cases, uh, the intensities pattern were quite differentiable. Like you can see that this five compounds, uh, uh, the 11 keto, octadecanoic acid, the linolenic acid, the phosphatidylcholine, another is uh, same choline and sphingonine. So these are uh, some uh, intensity expression of the individual compound. And you can see that in most of the cases, the all these metabolites were upregulated in Zabiha and downregulated in non-Zabiha uh, meat samples. Similarly, this is uh, a, a heat map by which you can see that the clear intensity difference of the compound that we have obtained and identified in Zabiha were differentiated with the uh, with non-Zabiha. And um, uh, I'm not going to talk about the detail uh, function of all these compounds, which we have discussed already in the paper. So these compounds somehow correlated logically with respect to their biosynthetic path with that why some of these compounds were upregulated. And for example, in case of linolenic acid, this is one of the essential you know, uh, uh, fatty acid requires for body growth and usually, uh, you know, uh, synthesized in, in plant and the, uh, outside the animal body. So this is one of the nutritional uh, fatty acid. And what we have observed that the concentration of these important uh, fatty acids found to be low in non-Zabiha. And it's very logical because in non-Zabiha, there is a chance to retain the blood and the body more so the the there's a more possibility to extract this linolenic acid from the muscles and the meat and pass out. And this is, yes, uh, can you hear me? Because there was a, a disconnection in between. Yes, Professor. Okay, should I continue? Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, as I have mentioned that uh, some of the identified compounds were somehow would be correlated in future in our upcoming study that how the stress level that we have observed especially in Zabiha or in non-Zabiha. So this could be another important finding that we, we are currently we are working on that. So uh, apart from this uh, important issue that we have addressed, we have also trying to develop the most easiest way to differentiate the, uh, uh, the pores in gelatin from the other animal source because you know it's quite difficult uh, uh, i mean the current the method available for the differentiation of gelatin obtained from various animal source is quite challenging so this is our ongoing work but the initial is this is the initial finding that i would like to uh, show you here that uh, the gelatin that we have observed from the poor scene is quite differentiable in terms of some peaks uh, we have uh, uh, we have analyzed uh, the gelatin from uh, various sources, uh, particularly porcine, and we identified a similar kind of pattern. So that work is undergoing, and hopefully soon we would be able to come up with a solution and the very rapid method for the uh, quick identification of the uh, gelatin obtained from the uh, uh, porcine. Another important issue, you know, associated uh, with the um, uh, food is related to the lard oil because, you know, the lard is something is quite uh, common, especially in the European country and the non-Muslim countries. So we have developed uh, a kind of method, which is a very easy and uh, rapid use uh, method based on uh, IR. And with the help of this method that uh, we were able to differentiate the lard oil with, with some various vegetable oils. So this method uh, uh, somehow really good to differentiate the, uh, the, the oil without processing, without mixing. So you can differentiate the lard oil uh, with the help of this technique. Uh, the paper has already been published. Uh, now, uh, the, these are the some example that we have uh, 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 you know, discuss related to uh, halal. Uh, very quickly, I would like to discuss the application of again uh, the mass pack uh, on different food stuff. Like in the case of chickpea, you can see that uh, the chickpea is one of the important uh, uh, crop uh, worldwide, and the people are consuming. So, uh, with this uh, technique, what we have done, we have tried to explore the effect of different uh, uh, seasonal effect on the yield and we have identified the some compounds as the osmoprotectant that how the 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 crop is showing the resistance under the uh, under the uh, 
uh, you know, the arid condition and that the low water uh, uh, supply. So we have identified some compound that uh, that have shown uh, that how they are protecting themselves from this, uh, uh, you know, the, the stress condition. Uh, addition to that, we, uh, we have analyzed uh, different uh, uh, rice varieties uh, related to basmati and non-basmati because, uh, you know, the basmati rice is quite common and demanding all over the world. But at the same time, once you have a mixing of basmati and non-basmati rice, so there could be a question as well. So, uh, so we have developed a kind of fingerprint again based on LCMS uh, and uh, try to identify the different, but these are the compound that we have identified a large number of compounds actually we have identified, but these are the main differential compound that we have identified uh, in between basmati and non-basmati. And with the help of these compounds, we were somehow able to differentiate the, uh, the, the one rice variety from the another rice varieties and published uh, a few years back. Uh, another uh, short example I would like to mention about the, uh, the mango because the mango is one of the important fruit of Pakistan and uh, 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 very tasty as well that we have in Pakistan. And you can see that especially in mango, there is a, a one liquid is known as sap and one is, you know, the, the flow on the surface of the mango, it caused sap injury. So we have extensively analyzed the chemistry of uh, these uh, sap identified and quantified different uh, terpenes and terpenoids for their concentration and then how we can correlate with this, uh, uh, with the processing of ripening as well. Another important thing that, you know, especially in Pakistan, that the people used to ripe the fruits artificially. And the calcium carbide, which is very uh, carcinogenic, is commonly used to put in the mango box to ripe the fruits because it produces ethylene gas, which actually the mimic the uh, the same ripening gas for the. So we have identified uh, somehow a develop a method based on ICPMS that how you can, can differentiate a mango from the uh, ripe from naturally or ripe from artificially with the help of carbide. So what we have done, we have identified and quantified some metals in the fruits and identified some metal that can be used to differentiate uh, a mango that is actually ripe artificially or, uh, uh, you know, with the help of uh, 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 calcium carbide. Uh, similarly, honey adulteration, we have identified this some compounds based on NMR that you can see a contamination of brown rice syrup because brown rice is another common adulterant which commonly mixed with the uh, honey and uh, used to sell out in the market. So I'm not going to talk about in detail, but has already been published so the relevant person can see. So that is the uh, a kind of method that we have uh, developed and identified an adulterant uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in honey uh, based on brown rice syrup. And this type of compounds, actually it's uh, fructose, glucose, and maltose. The maltose is a kind of compound which is actually common in uh, brown rice syrup and not common in honey. So you can identify if there is a presence of maltose in NMR. So it's a clear indication that is being ad uh, adulterated with the help of uh, brown rice syrup. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to just summarize the presentation. Uh, especially, uh, you know, as I've mentioned earlier that we have used the application of modern tool like mass spectrometry, uh, uh, especially for the analysis of food samples. You know, we are working on food <coughs> samples since long, but we have just in last few years, we have entered into the uh, into the analysis of forbidden substances uh, in the food. So I've presented uh, two case studies, especially the case study related to Zabiha and non-Zabiha meat differentiation. Uh, with the help of uh, LCMS tool and we have identified some important biomarkers that can be used to differentiate the Zabia and non-Zabia meat. Uh, here I would like to mention that uh, based on our preliminary study, we have extended our studies uh, for its validation or a large number of samples and so far we are getting really interesting results and most likely in upcoming years we would be able to uh, to 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 publish another paper regarding the validation of the identified compounds and based on that a kind of 
cheap uh, uh, tools can be used, which uh, uh, tools uh, can be developed for the differentiation of uh, uh, Zabiha and non-Zabiha meat. This is my research group, you know, uh, uh, we are working at the center, uh, HJ Research Institute of Chemistry, where we have a large number of instrumental facilities ranging uh, uh, from 300 to 900 megahertz instrument, dozens of uh, high-tech mass instruments uh, for the analysis of compounds. Uh, so under this project, uh, we have uh, some students that, that, that have worked uh, especially related to food analysis and some funding agencies who actually funded this work. So I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, all of them. So, so with all these, uh, I'm very thankful to the organizers as well for giving us a chance to share our findings. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Can you hear me? Okay. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation that you share your experience about the analysis of forbidden ingredient in daily use product that is really challenging for the Halan Authority in Nasiri. And you also give us the example how to analysis of biomarker of the chicken, um, uh, chicken meat from Sabiha and then Sabiha slaughtering process and also the dead meat. And you also give us the example of agricultural products in Pakistan, such as rice, mango, honey, uh, honey using NMA technique as well for skinning, purity, and contamination of food. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, topic is really useful uh, for in, in, the, in information. Uh, thank you again, Professor Musharraf. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, and next uh, presentation uh, uh, from uh, Associate Professor Dr. Minhas Udin Ahmad from Biosensor and Nanobiotechnology Laboratory, Faculty of Science, University Brunei Darussalam from Brunei. Uh, his expert is on many fields such as analytical and bioanalytical chemistry, nanomaterial, biomaterials, uh, point of care micro devices and DNA and protein bioinformatics and bioengineering. So today he will give a talk in the title of Food Originacy Detection and Understanding the Halal and Tayyip Food. Uh, Dr. Minhat, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rachari, and also the whole management team. I think you can hear me, right? Is yes. it? Is it clear? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so let me continue then. Okay, so today uh, I'm uh, going to present on uh, two of our recent findings, uh, how to determine food allergens. That is one specific type of allergen we have actually uh, focused on for the last couple of months and then we could uh, able to publish it. So if anybody is interested, you can see the whole details in the published materials, uh, which I will be sharing later. So the topic is food allergenicity detection and understanding the halal and Thai foods. Although I was thinking to discuss a bit on halal and Thai foods, but most of the speakers uh, earlier today, uh, yesterday, they have discussed part of it, but I will touch uh, some of it today. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would, I would like to acknowledge uh, a couple of funding agencies like our Ministry of Education and a couple of grants like university and different types of grants, especially uh, another ministry is a government grant that is called uh, Brunei Research Councils. We were spending a couple of um, bulk amount of money from these agencies to perform different kinds of research, including halal science. And for today's presentation, I would like to especially acknowledge two of my graduate students. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Azurin, and also another one, Mrs. Uh, Noor uh, Fazira. Uh, first of all, uh, what's our research impact? So in our laboratory, we are trying to work on different kinds of uh, detection strategies, uh, targeting food, 
different subclinical biomarkers and also microorganisms. Since the halal science is now expanding not necessarily on uh, porcine analysis, it is going beyond uh, the porcine like uh, Thaya foods. So if it is the Thaya foods, a pure or uh, harmless foods, we need to understand whether the food contains any food allergen, toxins, or any types of abnormal chemical agents, or I can say different types of microbes like bacteria and viruses. So meaning that we can expand our horizon and the research can be honestly unlimited. Uh, that's why last couple of years, we are trying to work on uh, DNA sensors, protein sensor, or different kinds of single molecules or traces of uh, molecules sensors to understand how different modalities can be developed so that the uh, bioanalytical chemistry or analytical chemistry can be improved further. And potentially this technology can be used for real applications. So for today, we can talk on food allergy. The, we know the food allergy is an abnormal response to a food, food, uh, to a food triggered by the body's immune system. And what is the immune system? The immune system is a complex network of cells that defends the body against infection. And why it is important, food allergy? Food allergy can be covered under a category a type of food because if we are not uh, tolerable to consume allergens, so if the food is not pure for us, we have to be careful before consuming peanuts, wheat, soy, or nuts, or kind of milk, or different kinds of fish. So we need to understand whether any kind of raw processed foods contain very specific type of allergen or not. If we know, and if you also know that, if you know this kind of foods contain this kind of biomarkers, and if we also know that we are very sensitive towards those biomarkers, we can avoid those foods. So how about the statistics? The statistics shows the food allergy affects up to six to eight percent of children under the age of three, and it affects up to four to six percent of adults. So this percentage of people suffers from lots of complications due to their known or unknown food allergenicity. So it is very important to consume right food for particular individual. If you see this picture, a person is suffering from severe allergy reactions and now lying in a hospital bed. He is suffering from anaphylaxis, which actually uh, creates multiple disorders, and it is mostly caused by shellfish allergy. So if you have the foods like and contain the shellfish allergen, your body can trigger excessive immune response and that can trigger abnormal behavior, you can see in here. So one of the top eight food allergies, shellfish allergy is extremely dangerous as we were telling and it can cause anaphylaxis reactions. That's why we need to consider it very seriously and it can create severe and life threatening conditions. As we know, it is, it is from the verse of the Holy Quran, the Bismillah of Mani Rahim, it is mentioned that, oh mankind, eat all that is halal and taiban, lawful and good on the earth and do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Verily he is an open enemy to you. So meaning that it is very important not necessarily to, con to consume halal but also the Thai food meaning which is good and pure for us. So now in one slide I'm trying to explain how halal taib and kabit can be discussed. Recently, I have got a lit interesting literature published by Professor Khalid Abu Hadid from Switzerland. He is trying to explain in such way, halal means permissible and covers all human actions and deeds. For example, eating, wearing, seeing, and talking. So if halal in the context of food, then taib is clearly coupled. How it is coupled? Because taib denotes as clean, pure, and comply with sharia. So your food should be halal and also should be taib. Whereas the kapit states everything that is impure, unlawful and disgust. So the story is eating halal taib is the path toward achieving a complete satisfaction. Anyway, so what are the advantages of taib and food safety? Taib deals with food hygiene, which is very important. 
food additives, pesticides, allergens, that part we will discuss on later uh, slides, and also food, various types of food contaminants like microbes, bacteria, viruses, toxins, or possibly hormones, because it is not good to consume excessive amount of hormone or any artificial injected hormone, which is, which is mostly injected to different types of animals. I also complies with uh, well with Sharia, enriches society with the spiritual value, spiritual moral values and human values. For example, very young and sick animals are not allowed to be slaughtered. No pork derived fertilizers should be used for the agriculture, and also we shouldn't use any hormone injected to animals for meat or for excessive meat or milk production. So these things are covering under the five meanings we are recommending to, uh, as part the Islamic Sharia or rituals, we have to follow that the food should be pure and healthy for us. So today we are talking on the allergen. The allergen may not be affecting everybody, but as I mentioned, four to six percent, which is large population if we consider. So today I, 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 would, I would like to discuss on tropomyosin, which is a seafood aller, allergen triggered by the crustaceans. And the critical point of, about the tropomyosin is, even if you are heating the seafood with high temperature for cooking purposes, the protein itself intact in a way that it can create a discomfort and also causing anaphylaxis, meaning that in its, not necessarily in its raw format, but also in its processed and cooked for, format, it can create different abnormal or adverse reactions to our body. That's why it is very important to understand how to trace traces, how to track or detect very traces of biomarker like tropomyosin in, in the uh, shellfish. So we had two projects and we have got funding for uh, tropomyosin analysis or largely different kinds of uh, Thai food analysis. So, and we have used tropomyosin as an initial biomarker and we have performed two strategies. One is electrochemical analysis and another one electrochemiluminescence analysis. What is for electrochemical analysis performed by uh, my PhD student, she was working on gold microrods, palladium nanoparticles, and polyanilin-based nanocomposite to modify the sensor substrate in such a way so that the recognition receptor or antibody can be attached in a better way, or you can say getting more room or more space so that it can track the biomarker in a more sensitive way. Or as for electrochemiluminescence analysis, we have used we have applied the voltage and generated with traces of light and that light was detected. The intensity of light was actually contributed by the what level of biomarker or tropomyosin is binding onto the sensor substrate. So on the first project, like electrochemical detection of tropomyosin, as you can see, we have used nanomaterials and composite and try to develop a paroxidase mimic. What does it mean, paroxidase mimic? We have tried to develop a composite. That composite will react with the substrate hydrogen peroxide and produce electron, and that electron can be detected. So the more biomarker we can attach onto the electron surface, the reactivity between substrate and enzyme, that is paroxidase mimic, will be disturbed and the signal will be reduced. So you can see this is the ACM image and how we have modified our uh, simple carbon electro surface with different nanomaterial. The base material we have used, the uh, screen printed carbon electrode. So this is the picture you can see we have tried uh, based on the spiking of hydrogen peroxide. Like you have the enzyme mimic onto the sensor as a sensor material, composite material itself, and hydrogen peroxide are reacting with the enzyme mimic. Based on the presence or absence or intensity of the biomarker, the response of hydrogen peroxide varied a lot. You can see the big difference. And what else for the uh, other case, we have also worked on a special type of uh, voltrometry analysis that is called differential pulse voltrometry to understand how potassium ferroferry responds in the presence or absence of uh, tropomyosin biomarker. 
So we have tried, as I mentioned, the chronoamperimetry, that is the surface itself producing, acting as an enzyme mimic, or as hydrogen peroxide react with the enzyme and produce uh, a product. Whereas in cyclic voltammetry, we try to show whether the layer is getting uh, different upon uh, putting different layers of different material, like gold micro rod, palladium nanoparticle, and polyaniline. And we have de developed two interesting figures in here you can see, which is also important if you are working in the analytical science, like limit of detections. We have tried to develop a calibration plot using differential pulse voltammetry and also chronoamperometry. The range actually we have got from 0 0.01 picogram to 100 picogram. I'll show you, we have got a different range while we work on electrochemiluminescence analysis in the uh, uh, next project. So we have also tried different stability and uh, selectivity, uh, spike and recovery assays. So these are very important to understand whether the sensor uh, itself is stable for quite a long time or not. You can see here the sensor shows six days, but I think we, we have more work to do we need to improve it further so that the, from six days, it can be like 30 days, or 60 days, or six months. These are the areas we need to work more. We have also tried on selectivity, like we tried on different types of other biomarkers, like lysozyme, casein, BSA, and ovalumin, and we have tried to understand whether we... Excuse me, can you hear me? Sorry. Moderator? Yes, I, I, I hear you. Okay, okay, sorry. So, okay. So this is the uh, selectivity study, which is very important to understand. The sensor itself is not cross-reacting with other non-specific proteins. And then a spike and recovery assay was also part of the uh, challenging uh, work, uh, like how we can uh, watch the level of detections once you spike, artificially spike the tropomycin in the food sample. We had actually struggled a lot, and we are still trying to understand what are the reasons how we can improve it better. But to uh, to convince the uh, journal editors, we, we also work on diluting the food matrix. And then once you dilute the food matrix, then we spike uh, different picogram ranges of tropomyces, you know, we try to recover. You can see the recovery percentage was almost 90% to 117%. And the RSD was within a uh, good range. And I will show you on the electrochemiluminescence project, the RSD or relative standard deviation was not that convincing like this uh, project. Uh, my slide is not moving, once again. Okay, so the, to conclude this project, uh, we have a uh, work on gold micro rod, palladium nanoparticle, and penny modified micro skin pit electrode and modified uh, electrodes, uh, giving a range of 0 0.01 picogram to 100 picogram of uh, allergen. And so far, we have observed excellent selectivity and stability, but of course, there are many room to improve. So, this work has been published in the Biosensor Journal in this year. And, and next part of the uh, presentation is electrochemiluminescence study, and we have used a uh, Hamamatsu uh, photonic device uh, that is called a uh, photomultiplier tube to, uh, to observe the change of photons due to the presence or absence of different levels of biomarker. So what is this project all about? We have initially uh, tried to work on only the bare carbon surface, but we are thinking that it might be very difficult to come up with better sensitivity and also hard to publish in quality journal. So, and also the project goal was to come up with new sensor or increase in the uh, sensitivity at the end of the day. So we work on carbon nano horn, uh, nephion, and iron oxide, um, palladium, uh, palladium nanoparticle. Why we have chosen carbon nano horn? We have seen that carbon nano horn got, got some defects and also more room to give more space for the recognition receptor or antibody to bind onto the surface. And overall, it is also giving more conductivity. So presence or absence of tropomycin, we could actually differentiate. You can see in here, A means presence of uh, the target and whereas B is the absence. Uh, 
So in uh, if you understand the electrochemical luminescence uh, in a in a way that in electrochemical luminescence you need to apply voltage in, in, onto the sensor substrate and then you are triggering a chemical reaction and at the end of the day the chemical reaction within a a uh, very short time will generate light, but without any heat. And that light you can actually measure by uh, photomultiplier tube. You can see in this picture that we have used all these nanomaterials and then gave the room for the recognition receptor or antibody. And then the thread-like structure, the tropomycin, is being trapped onto the uh, arm of the antibody. So what we have done, couple of uh, it's actually quite long project. It took almost a year to come up with all these good results. Uh, we are showing the, all the best results for publication, uh, also for the presentation. But background work was not that easy, but it was interesting. So molar ratio. First of all, we work on the molar ratio of the electrochemical illumination probe. Or we call it luminophore. We have used different ratio like one to ten, one to twelve point five, and one to one hundred. Even if we have seen that uh, different ratios published by the different groups, but for our project, the best, or we can say optimum ECL intensity or electrochemical luminous intensity we have achieved on 1 to 12.5. And then we have worked, uh, or we can say, uh, we can we have tried to compare iron oxide and palladium and gold and palladium. Then later we found that compared to gold, iron oxide palladium yield better SN ratio, better intensity response. Okay, so then we have tried to optimize the antibody, meaning the recognition receptor, which we are going to use onto the sensor substrate. And uh, we have found that the 10 microgram per ml is the best, or you can say the optimum uh, antibody concentration to be used. Because why you have chosen this one? Because presence or absence of antigen, it gave the best response, like 10 microgram per ml. Then we work on pH optimization, and as expected, I should say as expected, because in most of the cases, if you are working with biomolecules, the, the best results you will get in the physiological pH, that is pH 7.4. And you can see here, this is the bare to uh, 100 picogram of target, and we have worked layer by layer chemiluminescence intensity studies, and we have seen that we can see the difference from bare carbon sensor surface to the uh, ultimate target binding, which is very convincing. Okay, to, uh, based on the request from one of the reviewer, we also had to work on layer by layer characterization using potassium ferroferry using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And that we have shown, we have proved that, yeah, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy can also uh, prove that layer by layer changes has been. Uh, performed. And we also work on SEM, scanning electron microscopy. We try to see how bare carbon electron looks like compared to uh, carbon nanohorn or carbon nanohorn, iron oxide, and, um, all this modification at their different resolution or scale. And then this is the data you can see uh, how it is different from bare to tropomyosin or uh, the target binding, how we Prove the layer by layer characterization using cyclic voltrometry and also using the chronochrometry, which shows that how we can prove the surface charges are being changed upon binding from bare, uh, binding the target from the bare surface. And this is the chemistry on your right top. You can see ruthenium bipyridine was oxidized. Uh, Tripopyl uh, amine was also oxidized and both reactive intermediate, they are binding with each other. And at the end, at the end they are producing light in a short fraction of time. We have also worked on different other lumino, like luminol and cadmium telonyme and quantum dots, but uh, we have got the best result using ruthenium bipyridine. You can see also the smoothest peak we have got using the ruthenium bipyridine and TPRA. That's why we have chosen ruthenium bipyridine and TPRA combination uh, for this biomarker study, topomycin. As usual, it is very important to work on limit of detection, selectivity, repeatability, and stability. And we have got uh, all these types of results. And then we could actually come up with the, convince ourselves that, yeah, this sensor is really working. But 
One thing we are also not satisfied here that is a relative standard deviation, which we should be less than five percent. But we have learned something uh, by completing this project, and we hope that in future we can improve the relative standard devi uh, deviations. And we work on artificial spiking on different foods like Wasta sauce, rice cracker, imitation crab stick. We spike with different um, doses of uh, propomyosin, and we try to recover because. Um, that will give us a, uh, more control whether the sensor is really working or not. We have also compared our work with other published works and our sensitivity is around femprogram range compared to others like nanogram to picogram range. You can see the other groups, they are using SPR, in amperometry, flowsense, and ELISA, like mostly colorimetry analysis. So this is the sensitivity uh, around femprogram range. And interestingly, with this electrocumulus analysis, we have got broad dynamic range which is around femtogram to 100 nanogram. That actually really impressive and appreciated by the reviewer. So this is a project also we published in the Microchemica Acta this year. Uh, this is some, uh, our group. There are some other members that are not in here. We are working, it's actually a multi-faith group. We are working on sensor modality development. We are working on halal science. We are working on microorganism sensor or LRG sensor or different other types of biomarker studies. That's all from me. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Minhas, for a nice, very nice presentation. And you emphasize on the safety of seafood in terms of halal and also tayyip, that means clean and pure, with uh, Sharia Gumpayan. And you also develop the two Nobel sensor with uh, excellent sensitivity and high stability for nanomaterial and nanocomposite material for detecting thrombomyosin from uh, shellfish and chim, right? And those devices have potential to apply in real seafood sample. Okay, thank you again, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Minhas. You're welcome. And may I invite the next speaker Thank you, speaker. In this section, uh, may I invite uh, PhD candidate Ms. Keseni Ketleka from the Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. Her expert is on uh, Halan Science testing based paper device, a lateral flow immunochromography, and analytical chemistry. And today, she will give a talk in the topic of assisting and emerging technologies for Halan safety analysis. Uh, Ms. Kesini, please. Turn on your microphone. Okay. Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Very good afternoon, our speaker. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Um, today I would like to share with you the topic of existing and emerging technology for halal safety analysis. Uh, the spread of the coronavirus around the world increased the awareness of food to be consumed. However, the food industry normally have food safety management system based on the HACCP principles in place to, to manage food safety risks and to prevent food contaminations. Therefore, securing of the food throughout the food processing is to be ensured that the production process is missed all requirement and regulation. As regarding to the food production flow, one of the critical steps is the preparation of raw materials entering to the food production line. In fact, the quality and safety of the final product are determined by manufacturers. However, one of them is the food safety, one of, one of them is the safety of the individual raw materials. 
And once of the raw material is food additive, they are additive that they are substance that add to food in order to maintain or to improve the safety, improve the taste, texture, or appearance of food, and also for other technological function. According to the WHO and FAO, food additive can be categorized into three main groups, including flowering agents, enzyme preparations, and the other food additive. The flowering agents is uh, added to fruits, to, to food, to improve aroma and to improve taste. Uh, flowering agents derived from plants, spice, uh, vegetables, and wines are known as natural flowering agents. In addition, there are flowering agents that imit uh, imitate natural flower. Secondly, the second group is the enzyme preparation food additive. They are a type of food additive that may or may not end up in the final food products. Enzymes are a function, a functional protein that catalyze biological reactions by breaking down the larger molecule into the smaller building block. They can be obtained by extractions from plants, extraction from animals, and from microorganisms such as bacteria. In some cases, they are used as alternative to chemical-based technologies. And the last group is the food additive, that the other food additive. They are used for several reasons, uh, such as to uh, preservation, for colorings, for sweetenings. They are at when food is prepared and being packaged, being transported and stored, and they eventually become a component of the food. All of the food additives are proved to be safe whenever they, they uh, are used properly and compliance with regulations. The database of the international the database of the international numbering system for food additive is known as uh, INS number numbering system or sometimes E number system, which is uh, used in uh, European regions. And this is the growth of the food additive uh, of E number according to uh, of food additive according to the E numbering system. Although the food additive according to the E numbers or INS number are safe and proved to be used in food when considered the, the food safety requirement. However, in Halan, in which the safety of products mean that the food product have to be safe, not only to be compliant with food, uh, food safety control, which is include uh, chemical, biological, and physical hazards. However, mm -hmm. Uh, but also they have to be free from non-permissible substances, which are described in the Halan standard. Therefore, the Halan products are said to be higher safety standards and hygiene. Instead of E number, the Halan Science Center of Chulalongkorn University has developed the so-called H number, which is the database of Halan food additive. It can be used to replace in E number for halal food process. The database comes up with scientific knowledge and laboratory information. In addition, the, re the religion provisions among all this is done by the Majelitul Roma of Thailand. The halal database is benefit in terms of cost and time reductions. Therefore, halal product can compete with other non-certified halal products. According to accumulation of information uh, for established age number. We have found lots of food additive in which their status um, are questionable or doubtful. These substances encourage scientists to not only develop their alternative or replacements, but also to develop new methods or platform that enable to detect even when the concentration is low. Food additive such as color, uh, glycerol, food additive, such as uh, a group of color, glycerol and uh, glycerol derivative. Uh, food additive come from fatty acids and the ester of fatty acids, sorbitan and dye derivative, and the food additive derived from the edible bone phosphate and inosinic uh, derivative. Uh, accounting for the appropriate, uh, accounting for 
the appropriate detection or identification method. The suitable detection method differ between all these groups because the difference of the natures of each compound. Still yet, uh, the detections and the identification mostly based on the determinations of nucleic acids because of the high sensitivity and specificity. Nucleic acid is, is easily nature, uh, denatured when exposed to the enzyme. Therefore, the extraction protocol along to the detection protocol require well-trained personnel. And the protocol has to be carried out in, the in a clean area to eliminate contamination. Another analytical method capable to detect inhalant safety is using the protein-based detection method, which is more stable than, than uh, using nucleic acids. This method are ongoing to develop under, un, under our laboratory. As such, the origin source of gelatin containing in the food matrix are well identified, are, are well identified by difference of its amino acid composition from the different source. The protein-based uh, te technique, however, needs a uh, high laboratory instrumentation, such as the LCM LCMSMS in order to interpret interpreting the results. Uh, this slide show the all facility that we have in the Halan Science Center, Jalalongkorn University. Uh, in addition to the laboratory test method using uh, high technologies and as one laboratory instrument. However, the newly developed platform for the points of care are still needed because uh, they are ease of operation, operations are rapid, cheap, and portable. The result can also be interpreted with uh, untra untrained personnel. The microfluidic paper-based device is promising for points of care detections or monitoring in order to reduce reagents and sample consumption. The paper, based, the paper substrate had recently become popular substrate because it is highly abundant substrate, which capable of solution flow spontaneously without the needs of the pumping system. In addition, the product structures of paper could trap contaminants and other complex com compound. So, is provide filtering cap capability, which is uh, appropriate for processing complex uh, food sample in like such as food metric. The Halan Sai Center to Lalongkorn University led by uh, Dr. Anateng Jinjo developed the multiplex uh, detection technique for detections of nine forbidden animal species within one analysis. The technique is based, based on the DNA milk curve high resolution melting analysis or HRMA analysis. Which, and it is the ongoing development to the paper based lateral flow analysis for rapid testing and for easy to use on site. The LTA analysis or lateral uh, flow analysis is fabricated using the paper substrate upon with uh, nucleic acids immunoassay. The samples flow through the paper by capillary actions to reach the, the detection area where the captured DNA uh, is immobilized. The color test line, as you can see from the slides, is clear at the test line is clear and easy to reach out from the test tip. Without uh, the, the, the samples can interpret with, without any instrument required. In addition to the lateral flow analysis, the study of the modifications of the surface of uh, paper scaffold was developing uh, in order to improve the binding properties of analyze on the paper. The molecular imprinting techniques is used to synthesize a uh, recept uh, receptor for uh, target binding on the paper. As such, there are analogs of the natural antibody and antigen system 
it can be applicable as a sensor. In this case, the grafting of the paper surface with the MIP creates a size for an ally to buy. And the specific size can be applicable to enrich the analyte on a paper. Therefore, it is benefit not only to improve the sensitivity, but also the extractions of analyze. In conclusion, uh, the raw materials or food additive entering the halal production chain, it has to be proved not only they are safe from chemical, biological, physical, and hazard, uh, physical uh, hazard, but also they have to be safe from non-permissible substances or haram substance. According to their origins, they can be classified as substance derived from animals, from plants, minerals, synthesis, and fermentations of bacteria. The halal status need approval individually. The concern is true are animal origin in which the substance does not, origi does not origin from the haram animals or GMO, origin which uh, origin gene of uh, haram animal animals. The extraction using alcohol is acceptable, in which the remaining alcohol should be removed as much as possible. The issue of fermentation is the concerns of, of alcohol produced during the process. Moreover, the compositions of the media used to grow bacteria. There are several relevant subs, uh, substances still not yet been developed for the alternative or replacement. The method capable of detection are thus need with the highest advantage and effectiveness. The innovative platform is promising because it can be used for on-site monitoring and uh, rapid results obtained. This is to encourage scientists working collaborations to successful net development of a novel innovative platform to be introduced to the Halan safety analysis. And that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kesini, for a very great presentation. Uh, Ms. Kesini gave us the information about some questionable ingredient or some uh, food additive in uh, Halan status uh, from her uh, H-number database. And also, she gave the example of the development of microfluid device uh, of the uh, questionable food additive that meet uh, the needs of on-site, real-time, rapid, and portable detection. Uh, thanks, thank you again, uh, Ms. Kesini. And the last speaker for this session uh, from Egypt, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Mossad Atia Abdel Wahab. Uh, he is a professor of toxicology and pharmacology from Food uh, Toxicology and Contamination Department, Food Industry and Nutrition Division, a National Research uh, Center of Egypt. And today he will give a talk in the topic of Highland strategy to boost immune system during COVID-19 pandemic and after new normal. Also, please. Could you turn uh, on your microphone, please? Turn on your microphone, officer. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ashley. I am, and I am very sorry for the delay, but I had uh, some problem in the connection. But it is solved, alhamdulillah. Okay. Now I am going to start my presentation. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inshallah, I am going to talk uh, today about halal strategy to boost immune system during COVID-19 pandemic and after new normal. 
Uh, first, I have to give some uh, information about the immune system. What is the immune system in the body? The human body has several systems uh, work as uh, immune system, such as mucous membrane, uh, tonsils, lymphatic vessels in the neck, and the thymus gland, and the lymph nodes, uh, skin, the spleen, and the lymphatic, lymphatic cells in the legs, and bone marrow. These are the components of the immune system in the body. But the main immune system are the immune cells, which are produced by in bone marrow. Bone marrow produces lymphoplastis. Lymphoplastis, if they may stay as the bone marrow for maturation or migrate to the thymus gland. If they stay as the bone marrow, they said B cells, B from bone, B cells, and if they go to the thymus gland, they call the T cells. But when the, 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 the lymphoblasts migrate to thymus uh, gland, are uh, form two types of cells, um, regular cells, T cells, or effector T cells. The effector T cells change again to cytotoxic or killer T cells. However, the regular T cells may, uh, may, may make two types of cells, supporter T cells or helper T cells. But those migrate, say, as the bone marrow, which is called P lymphoplasty, lymphocytes, they uh, differentiate to plasma cells or memory cells. The plasma cells produce the antibody and they are of, um, the uh, last form, the humoral response. But those uh, migrate to the uh, uh, thymus gland, uh, make the cellular response or the mediated response. Okay. Well, we have three lines of defense. The, the immune system has three lines of defense. The first line is the skin and the mucous mucosa paris. They are tightly connected epithelial cells that cover the surface of the body prevent any pathogen, pathogenic organism to penetrate the, the body. So the skin and mucosa secrete secretion tab the pathogenic organism in the surface of the body and they don't not allow them to go to enter, to enter the body this is the first line the second line of the immune system is the innate immune cells and molecules they are consisted of several types of cells such as mast cells natural killer cells monocytes macrophage the dendritic cells, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, the five types of white blood cells, they are uh, the, the second uh, line of defense. In this case, in this cells resistant in the body that promotes the immune system, they can swell or destroy the virus when it enters the body. They release signal to restrict more immune cells awaken the forest of the third uh, uh, line if they fail to control the situation. But the third immune system line is a uh, cell of adaptive immunity. The antibody bind to the virus. Here, this is the virus. And the antibody, virus. The antibody bind to the virus and block its adhesion side to the cell in the membrane, so it prevent it to penetrate the cell and go inside the cell. This is the third line of immune system. Okay. But the cytotoxic T lymphocytes destroy the infected cell and the virus. How? Oh. This is cytotoxic T, T, lymph, uh, T cells in the body. Is it inter, uh, uh, the infected cells? This is the infected cells. The infected cells. And this is the foreign body. When the infected cells uh, come, the cytotoxic cells adhere to the uh, site in the virus 
and release some kinds of protein that destroy the infected cells and prevent the spread of the virus. So the T lymphocytes become free again, and this is the infected cells. This is the first last time. But the outcome of the immune response. In most cases, virus is blocked in the first and second line. Don't penetrate the body. The response happens silently. No, we don't feel anything at this time. The virus comes to the body, but the body treats with it with the first and second line, so the one cannot feel anything. But in some cases, virus is strong. So immune system will take more action, more measures to attack the virus. These measures may make you feel uncomfortable. Sometimes the head ash or temperature rise or something like this. This is the second time. But in rare case, sometimes the immune response is so intense that many host cells are destroyed, which impair the lung infection. And this is if the body failed to control the virus or treat with the virus. So, we have, there are several ways to boost our immune system to fight coronavirus. The first system in the era of COVID-19 and the pandemic crisis, this is just depending on four main uh, axes. The food security within the population lockdown, the bioactive ingredient supporting human health, food safety within the pandemic crisis, and the sustainability of the food system in the new era. There are four main axes affect the food system in the new era, and the era of COVID. So, COVID-19 and the immune system booster. There are several vital halal uh, sources, halal uh, ingredients that may act as very, very effective to control uh, coronavirus. That's such as zinc, which was found in several food, vitamin C, iron, vitamin E, vitamin A, and vitamin B6. They are very, very important for the treatment of coronavirus. In general, we have a balance between optimal, optimal nutrition status, the nutrient intake and the bad nutrient need. We have to be a balance. The food intake is affected by the socioeconomic behavior and emotion and the cultural pressure. In the same time, the absorption of the food in the body depends on the environment, some disease, some pathogenic, uh, physiologic stress and uh, mechanical problem, if you have any problem in the stomach. So, uh, in the other side of the balance, body maintenance as will be and will be, it should be, this depends on the uh, nutrient requirement of the body. So, this is affected by infection, the fever, physiological stress also, okay? In general, inadequate dietary intake may lead to weight loss, growth filtrating, and immunity lowered and mucosal damage. This also can lead to disease, and serious disease. The severity of the disease also is affected by this, and the duration of the disease. This all lead to the appetite loss and nutrient loss, metabolic malabsorption, and alter the metabolism, which lead in the last to inadequate dietary food intake. So they are a circle, cannot be stopped at any time. Impact of imbalance of the and deficiency of food. Inadequate intake impaired the absorption. This is the first line, sick. The, and the increased nutrient loss, which lead to upon a body stored and tissue level de depression. 
depletion. The depletion of the neutrons in the body. This leads to the biological dysfunction. Biogenic dis biological dysfunction leads to physiological dysfunction. The physiological dysfunction leads to cellular dysfunction, which lead to the clinical thing and symptoms of the disease, which lead to the morbidity and then mortality. So food, the food is very, very important. And not only on the food, but the nutrient in the food is very, very important to treat against uh, disease. So, the nutritional, nutrition and nutritional thesis in, in the aliens, in the, during the aliens, aliens lead to alter the food intake, alter the digestion, alter metabolism, and alter extraction, which lead to the nutritional inequality and malnutrition, which also lead to more illness. So, it is also a big circle. So, the nutritional inequality are prevalent, but the problem is prevalent and very costly and very, very uh, cost. But the solution is assessment and the uh, intervention. In the general, nutritional screening or uh, refer, refer. Lead to nutrition assessment, which lead to nutrition diagnosis and nutrition intervention and then lead to the nutrition monitoring and evaluation. So, in general, there are several halal strategies to boost our immune system. The function of the immune system, like most system in the body, is dependent on proper nutrition. So, energy intake seems to have an important influence in the immune activity. So, other solution people, the people who are not to eat good food or good food, are at great risk from the infection with virus. So, regular cons consumption of fermented dairy product as your good or caviar may enhance the immune defense in the gut. Your good made with certain bacteria, the probiotic bacteria, may have a beneficial effect on the immune system. But human volunteers who are eating your gut every day, made with specific probiotic bacteria, show a higher resistance to microorganisms that cause food uh, burden. So, the immune system maintenance required a steady intake of all the necessary, such as vitamins and minerals. So, the supplement did not simulate immune response in the healthy volunteer. The people with good health do not need to uh, take a food supplement with a uh, nutrient. <coughs> and the people who are also well nutritioned individuals. <coughs> Sorry. However, a multivitamin and mineral supplementation may boost their immune system also in the healthy volunteer. So, supplement may be required. In the recovery phase of malnutrition or in person with malabsorption syndrome. A specific food may also affect the immune system, for example, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, and food rich in omega 3 fatty acid may foster a healthy immune system. But in excess, pro inflammatory trans and saturated fatty acid can cause imbalance in the immune system too. So it, no, it is not free to take anything at any time. Minerals are very, very important. So for example, iron deficiency and excess of iron increase infection. Zinc is essential for immune competence, especially mucous immunity. Small amount of zinc quickly rise the blood levels of T cells in elderly people. Carbohydrate also is very, very important because the, the carbohydrate supplies the immune system with energy that so that it can work better and fight disease. The immune system needs uh, energy. However, high blood sugar reduces immunity by reducing the function of immune cells. So people with diabetes are suffer from the immune deficiency. Although in 
it, uh, it increases the carbon, increase cortisol secretion and reducing immune function for even further. So not free to take carbohydrate anytime and before. So nutrient feed activity can be reduced by 50% by the excess wheat and sugar intake. Protein is very, very important because protein makes enzyme and immunoglobulin, which helps the immune cell kill germs and virus and bacteria. They also help keep the gastrointestinal tract and immune system healthy. Protein lack cause atrophy of lymph organ, which uh, with reduction in T lymphocytes production. Protein deficiency make the skin and the mucous membrane brittle and break down easily. So protein very important too. Vegetarian food, halal food for the best uh, immunity. First, the vegetarian diet. The white blood cells in vegetarian are twice as effective against tumor cells as those of eat of meat eaters. The accurate reason is unknown, but may have something to do with the higher level of photochemical, photochemical richly available in vegetables and fruits, as well as lower level of fat in the rice. This is for the vegetarian. Vitamin C rich food. Vitamin reputation is an immune enhancer. Has fluctuated over time, a stress of any kind, physiological or physical increase, our need to vitamins. When you think vitamin C, think more than orange juice. It is very, very, very rich in vitamin C. Broccoli also, broccoli also contains three times as much as vitamin C as crude. So broccoli is very, very important. Also mushroom. Mushroom appears to be powerful immune stimulant. They contain an antiviral substance that boosts um, T cells and macrophages, large cells that swallow and destroy foreign parasites, foreign particles. This beefy mushroom is becoming more widely available in many supermarkets as demand of it increases. Garlic is very, very important for the immune system too, because garlic could have as much as our immune system and as it does for, for our best body. It appears to increase not only the number of neutral killer, <coughs> killer cells, but also their potency. T helper <coughs> silk are stimulated by garlic intake. <coughs> Cartonoids. <coughs> there is evidence that many members of this antioxidant group are helpful to our immune system. A high intake of cartonoid rich foods such as orange or colored vegetables and fish in particular increase T cells and in natural killer cells and antibody response. Pumpkins and the winter squash as well as carrots, beaches and the cantaloupe are especially good source. So may green vegetables so my green vegetables are also rich in cartoon Herbs and immunity. Several herbs have extensive history to help us to fight a variety of disease. Many of these herbs contain substances that work specifically to boost the immune system in different ways. Purple corn flour is the best known of the Western in the of the Western immune stimulating herb. It enhances the immune system through several mechanisms, mainly through activating the T cells and increasing the virus fighting infection. It is particularly helpful the, in the common cold. Ginger. This bunker through stimulates the production of interferon, 
and has a direct anti-inflammatory property. Chloric root, it has been widely used in Eastern and Western countries for medicinal properties. It is particularly helpful in fighting the virus such as influenza. Probiotic flora is very, very important also because to help keep a healthy balance of microbial population in intestinal infection. Probiotic bacteria improve both local and general innate immunity. Probiotic bacteria also may, may also have anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. So we have to just look for the right and immune system and variety. Generally, many nutrients play a role in our immune system, such as vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, zinc, and folate. So, but this way to get enough of these is a, to eat a varied diet. This means eat from all the K food group, plus vegetables, plus carbohydrates, dairy, meat, eggs, and uh, alternative and oil, and change your meals regularly. Fruits and vegetables are known subjects. So, the suggested halal nutrition, halal nutrition treatment for minimizing and fish in it and morbidity and eradicating HIV-19 biology. First, the first supplement. Several years ago, we developed a Tukudami as a natural food supplement rich in micronutrients, phenolic compound and probiotic, and it has already approved by FDA and the marketing in different countries, including USA, Thailand, Malaysia, China, and others. This product uh, boosts the immune system, and now it's used for the treatment of COVID-19, AIDS, and other several immune deficiency disease. This product was used tactically for COVID-19 treatment in your hand during the pandemic, in the first uh, appeal of the virus in your hand. They use this product to treat uh, the virus. So the Sarkissed Halal Supplement, uh, recently a medical team from Egypt developed anti-COVID-19 treatment at a novel evidence-based approach using a natural protocol for treating COVID-19 patients. Uh, it consisted of one small spoon teaspoon or teaspoon of black seed oil or two grams of seeds mixed with one gram green component, mixed with one large spoon full of natural honey. This is very, very, very effective against COVID-19 and many people use it in Egypt now. This is it. black seed and common and These are very, very booster for the immune system and the immune So, in conclusion, how to fight to be 19 infection? We have to do several steps. First, immunity is your best guard. So, we have to take care of our immunity and our immune system. We have to eat plenty of fresh vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and whole grain. We have to limit junk food in the household. We have to do exercise regularly. We have to avoid a stressful situation and sleep well to boost our immune system. And I think it is okay now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ashley. I took 20 minutes exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Professor Mozart, for a very informative presentation. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much. That give more understanding mechanism to boost our immune system for controlling and eliminating COVID-19 infection by consumption of many halal nutrition food or food supplement. Thank you once again, Professor Mozart.
and now we have a uh, limit of time, so we have a few questions. Uh, the first, uh, the first question go to uh, Professor Sayyid Mashallah. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, as you mentioned, the Sabiha meat have some metabolite or nutrient more than uh, non Sabiha meat, uh, which the possible mechanism of you can explain the relationship between halal throttling uh, with the product of that compound. Professor uh, Mushla, okay. uh, There are several supplements in the market, maybe from non halal source. So, uh, is so, this question to me or to uh, Mushra? Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, as I have mentioned that uh, uh, by taking the one example of linolenic acid, this is one of the important uh, nutrients. Uh, uh, actually, it's uh, omega fatty acids. So, you know, what we have explained that probably because of uh, in non zabiha we have a high concentration of blood in the body and the blood retained in the body. So, there is a more chance to interact or to extract these nutritional compounds from the meat in, into the blood. You know, that probably the reason that why we have the lesser concentration of these important nutrients in non zabiha So that could be the possible way that it's nothing but the extraction, more extraction to in the blood, you know, in the non zabiha side. Thank you, Professor. And uh, the second question go to Dr. Minhas. Uh, the question is uh, of the halal certified meat uh, uh, is package in supermarket contain hormone. Uh, this have terrible health side effect, especially on uh, women and uh, young girls. So what do you think about this? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, they, they say that uh, they are certified uh, product that con containing the hormone that is really uh, have the side effect, uh, especially for the women yeah. and young girls. So what do you think in terms of the halal or taijip? Okay, actually, in terms of Taib, I can answer quickly. We need to understand that the, what type of hormone actually being injected to what type of animal and then uh, come up with some strategy how to detect that kind of hormone, okay, as early as possible. Uh, most likely, it is uh, like uh, for RBST hormone injected to bovine or cow, and then it's actually we have seen this hormone is being available in the milk. So, uh, it, it actually, the regulatory body also should uh, check carefully whether that hormone can be administered at that at particular level to animal or not, and whether the milk is still having that level of uh, RBST hormone or not, okay? So, yeah, it is important to understand that what sort of hormone uh, we are injecting to animal and whether that hormone is creating a problem or not. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Minhas. Uh, because of the limit of time, so I would like to finish uh, this session. And uh, thank you very much for all distinguished speaker and valuable contribute uh, for and also the uh, participant in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all speakers. Thank you moderator Dr. Ashari Suksuan. Thank you. Remind to all participants, I would like you to fill out the online evaluation form with scan the QR code on screen board or click link to in chat board of Zoom or Facebook Live. Now it's time to take a break, 20 minutes. Thank you. เรียนท่านที่กำลังรับชมผ่านทาง Zoom นะคะดิฉันขออนุญาตประกาศรายชื่อครั้งสุดท้ายสำหรับผู้โชคดีที่ทางทีมงานได้สุ่มรายชื่อจากการที่พวกพวกเราทุกท่านได้ฟังผ่านทาง Zoom นะคะรายชื่อ,อทั้ง14ท่านนะคะครั้งนี้ทางทีมงานได้สุ่มรายชื่อมา14ท่านด้วยกันนะคะดิฉันจะอ่านแล้วใครที่มีรายชื่อดังต่อไปนี้ให้เข้าไปยืนยันตัวตนใน
ชทจูบนะคะท่านแรกนะคะคุณอาฟีฟีนุ่งอาหลีท่านที่สองรุชดามาลิซอนท่านที่สามปกประกรณ์กลิ่นกเกษรท่านที่สี่อานนยอรมินท่านที่ห้าสมหญิงเกตประสิทธิ์ท่านที่หกวิยดาสุรัตท่านที่เจ็ดนูราปานนพพาท่านที่แปดจาริยาโตลังท่านที่เก้าลาวันจีระสุรเดชท่านที่สิบสมภพจันจันทีระท่านที่สิบเอ็ดตาพาพิสิทธิ์กลิ่นกลันท่านที่สิบสองสุปราณีโอลาท่านที่สิบสามคุณสุริดาอาบาลีท่านที่สิบสี่ท่านสุดท้ายนะคะท่านที่สิบสี่สุภัตราหาดดูมัดนะคะสิบสี่ท่านผู้โชคดีนะคะค่ะติดต่อทีมงานทางแชทบอร์ดนะคะและในระหว่างนี้ก็คือเราพักเบรก20นาทีนะคะและกลับมาพบกับเซสชั่นต่อไปค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ